Welcome to the basics of stoichiometry, and in order to talk about the topic, we need to start off with a pretty decent definition of what it is, and to give a really good idea of uh, what's going on uh, with the topic. So, the way it's usually defined is the calculation of quantities in chemical reactions, but I always found that pretty vague, so oftentimes I'll uh, introduce it as how much stuff you start out a reaction with in the real world and how much other stuff uh, you have at the end. And I usually do start this out by using a cooking analogy, which works pretty well. So suppose you have five people coming over for dinner. All right. And you know they're going to show up. And you've got this casserole recipe that serves five people. And among other stuff that goes in it, it calls for one pound of ground beef. But then later you find out at the last minute that everybody has also invited their boyfriend or girlfriend, and suddenly you're cooking for 10 people, all right? And so the big dilemma is how in the world will you know how much ground beef to make of casserole for 10 people? How much ground beef do you need? It's just a huge dilemma. What are you going to do? Because your recipe only shows that you use one pound for uh, five people, and how in the world are you going to figure out for 10? And if you're really honestly stuck on that, it might be a good idea just to stick to microwave stuff. But anyway, but like most people, if you immediately see that you just simply double the recipe, which includes using two pounds of ground beef instead of just one pound, then you know, congratulations, you understand the basic principle of stoichiometry. Uh, just sometimes you need not exactly the same amount as what, what is called for in the recipe. And you don't really have to be a master cook uh, to figure that out. So in chemistry, we don't have recipes. We have chemical formulas uh, to tell us what amounts of stuff we start with and what we're supposed to have uh, when we're done. So as an example here, we've got, uh, essentially it's an abbreviation for the photosynthesis reactions, carbon dioxide and water forming sugar and, and oxygen. But you remember from prior lessons, I'm sure, that uh, the reactants are what we start with and the products are what we have at the end. And usually stoichiometry involves predicting exactly what uh, amount we'll end up with if we start out with a different amount than what is shown in the chemical uh, equation. All right. So the only other thing that I wanted to add sort of parenthetically is that the chemical equation has to be balanced uh, to begin working a stoichiometry problem. Oftentimes you'll see stoichiometry tutorials and they'll go off into uh, kind of a tangent balancing equations and we're not doing that here. I'm just going to show you the stoichiometry but that it does have to be balanced in order to begin working the problems. All right. So um, the numbers out front, which are the coefficients, uh, are often read as the number of molecules involved in a reaction. Very often in chemistry books, depending on the topic, the interpretation will be the number of molecules, like you see the illustration here. But in stoichiometry, the coefficients are read as the number of moles. All right. That's an important uh, thing in, in interpreting uh, stoichiometry. So it says in this example, four moles of ammonia, you see written in red, will react with five moles of oxygen gas to yield four moles of nitric oxide and then six moles of water. That's easy enough, right? Okay, but most of the time when we deal with these chemicals uh, that are in amounts that are other, other than the exact amounts shown in the equation, it's not as neat and orderly as it is in a, uh, in a recipe. As it says here, tragically, uh, you're not going to mainly be either doubling or having uh, anything. You've got to do a little bit more complicated math than that, but not uh, a lot more complicated. Anyway, here's an example of one of the simpler, uh, one of the very basic uh, stoichiometry problems. It says using the equation below to predict how many moles of water are produced when 3.21 moles of ammonia reacts with an excess of oxygen. And in case you're wondering what excess of oxygen means, it just means that all the NH3, all the ammonia, reacts before the O2 runs out. So what the question is asking is, is how can we tell from the equation how many moles of water are formed when 3.21 moles of NH3 reacts instead of four moles? Because the equation is obviously only good for four moles. So as it says in English, the key part of the equation tells us that for every four moles of ammonia, right here, uh, that reacts six moles of water, right there, are produced. Uh, when this is written out as a fraction, 
This is an example of what is called a mole ratio, and it's extremely important in stoichiometry. It's the ratio of the number of moles of any two reactants or products in a chemical reaction. But where do we get the mole ratios from to use as our conversion factors? That sometimes is a little bit of a stumbling block initially, but fortunately they're going to be right in front of your face. <laughs> uh, you get the mole ratios from the equation itself. Uh, for example, the ratio of O2 to H2O, as you can see here, is 5 to 6, usually written with a little colon like that. Uh, O2 to NO is 5 to 4, as you would predict. And NH3 to H2O, which is the question that we're wondering about here, is 4 to 6. All right, so used in a stoichiometric calculation, a mole ratio is ordinarily going to look like this. It's going to look like basically just a fraction. It's going to look like a typical uh, type of conversion factor. And obviously, depending on what you're converting is depending on what is in the numerator and the denominator. Um, what needs to be canceled, as it says here. All right, so um, in the very simplest case, there are some stoichiometry problems that are like this, that everything's in moles. And if that's the case, uh, you're just going to write down your given value, which is 3.21 moles of uh, NH3, and uh, multiply it by the appropriate mole ratio. Just making sure it lines up and cancels. So there's the given value. And if you notice here, the given value has the units of moles of NH3. So we're going to want to make sure and put moles of NH3 in the denominator. We do that here. We cancel everything out. And we say 3.21 times 6. We hit equals and then divide by 4. And we're going to have 4.82 moles of water. All right. So... This means basically that in real life, if we reacted 3.21 moles of NH3 instead of 4, then the reaction is going to generate 4.82 moles of water instead of 6. And again, it's just like altering a recipe for a different number of you know, people showing up at your house. All right, so, um, so far we've just been dealing with moles, and you see the equation up here. It's not terribly complicated uh, at this point, but it turns out in real life it's going to get a little bit more complicated, not too bad. The main thing is because that there's no lab instrument like Star Trek or something that scans and reads the amount of moles in a sample or the number of molecules or whatever. So in the real world, you almost always are going to be starting out with the number of grams. Um, so for a stoichiometry problem to work, the mole ratio must be multiplied or divided by, and I don't often say wait for it, but wait for it because it's important, Moles. You have to have everything converted into moles. All right. So a summary here is what we've done, what we just got through looking at, what we just got through doing, was taking moles of reactant, kind of running it through the mole ratio conversion factor, and then converting it into moles of product. We did that with the ammonia and the water in the in the previous reaction. In the real world, again, you don't typically start out with moles of reactant. What you typically do is start out with grams of reactant. So you got to convert that to moles then run it through the mole ratio conversion factor eventually, and then convert it back into grams to record it in grams. So it's really not that much harder. It's just maybe a little bit more of a pain in the butt. For a more realistic type of problem, we want to look at this. How many grams of water are produced when 23.9 grams of NH3, that's ammonia, uh, reacts with an excess of oxygen? And we're going to need a single equation with three conversion factors, each of which is fairly easy to remember. Uh, the first one is just to convert from grams to moles. And when you're going to see when we work the problem out, when we come across ammonia, the conversion factor is going to be 17.04 uh, grams per mole for ammonia. That's what you get when you add all the atoms up uh, for that. Uh, the second conversion factor we're going to need is the mole ratio to convert from uh, the moles of one reactant or product into the moles of another reactant or product in a problem like this. And then lastly, we're going to need one to convert back to grams, which adds up to, for water, in this case, this is 18.02 uh, grams per mole. All right, so diving into the problem a little, uh, if we start with 23.9 grams of NH3, I want to find out how many grams of water are produced. All we have to do is write down the given value followed by first the conversion factor that converts the given value into moles. So you notice the grams of ammonia are uh, able to cancel out. 
And now we've got moles of ammonia. So now we can work with our mole ratio because everything is in moles now. So the second thing we're going to have to do is to use the mole ratio, uh, which will give us the number of moles of product for the given amount of reactant. So you'll notice here that the moles of ammonia are lined up with the moles of ammonia in the conversion factor, so we can get rid of them. And then we want our answer to be in units of water. Now, if we stopped right here, we would actually get the correct answer, but it would be in moles. So all we need really is one more conversion factor so we can convert moles of water into grams of water. And that's all we have to do. So the last one is conversion factor we get uh, so we can get the answer into grams. And we have uh, the moles of water canceling out, giving us grams of water. That 18.02 is the number of grams of water per mole. Then all we have to do is do the math, multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, take the ratio. We end up getting 37.9 uh, grams of water. And that is it. And this is a fairly representative uh, stoichiometry problem. There's another way of working this that I find easier, uh, but either way you want to work it, and I'm going to show you this way, and if you like it, that's great. If you don't, you can work it the other way. Anyway, it involves, instead of having one big long equation with three conversion factors, you basically have three smaller equations, each with one, one conversion factor. It just seems easier to follow that way. And the way it works is basically just having three short steps, like I said, but including what's called guard digits, which I'll show you in a second. It's really nothing to include uh, that will avoid uh, rounding errors. So let me uh, show you this. The step one, predictably enough, is convert to moles. So it's just a step where you take the given value and convert it to moles. Hopefully everybody knows how to do that uh, by now. But the only thing is, is you don't round it until you get to the end. So you don't round this step. You leave a couple of extra uh, what are called guard digits. And the reason you do that is if you, if you don't, if you go ahead and round it with every step, with three steps, each time you're rounding, you're leaving off information. And by the time you get to the end, you throw some error into there. So you want to leave those guard digits in there. The second step, predictably enough, is to multiply by the mole ratio uh, to get the answer in moles. So this is just like uh, any other stoichiometry problem. You take the uh, previous value that we just calculated and then line up the uh, values so that the moles of NH3 will cancel out. And we multiply across the top, divide by 4, and we end up with, in this case, 2.1038. We leave the guard digits on again. Uh, and uh, this is, just like in the prior uh, example, this is the answer. It's just the answer in moles. So the only thing that remains is to convert that back to grams. And that's step three. We just take the value that we've calculated, uh, the number of moles of H2O, and convert that back into grams. Uh, the moles of H2O go out, and we end up with exactly the same answer uh, that we did in the earlier, uh, longer type of uh, step with one long equation. So either way will work, whichever way that you prefer, whichever way is easy, easier for you. And uh, that's it for this example problem. All right, so to summarize, uh, stoichiometry allows us to use equations that have fixed amounts and use them to do calculations for the amounts we actually have. Uh, the mole ratio, which is just extremely important, uh, represents the relative amounts of reactants and products and can be used to show how much reactant or product can be expected in a given reaction. Um, most of the time, you have to convert a given value to moles and then back into grams or to some other unit, but most of the time it's grams. Together with the mole ratio, this usually means three conversion factors. And uh, the mole ratio can also be used to predict how much of one reactant would be needed given a certain amount of a second reactant. So you could be, you know, you could be uh, trying to figure out amounts of reactants instead of amounts of product. It doesn't really matter. The math would be identical. And also, um, sometimes when dealing with gases, the answer is going to need to be given in liters instead of in grams. And the same principles are going to apply, uh, but it's just going to have slightly different conversion factors. Uh, that will really be the only difference. And uh, But I am going to show those in a separate uh, tutorial. And that is it.